We're going to do four quick updates on our projects before we let you all go. Uh, we have Neela Jacques from our Open Daylight project, Glenn Sullivan from our Open Switch project, Dan Kahn from our Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and Nico von Sumrin here to talk about the core infrastructure initiative. So I will have Neela start it off. Uh, Neela, I'm not sure where you are, but come on up on stage. Please welcome Neela Jacques from our Open Daylight project. Thanks, everybody. Um, I have to say it's great to be standing up here for what is probably uh, my last, or I guess this afternoon is my last talk for the Open Daylight Project. And, and so, in fact, given a, giving an update allows me to look a little bit back. And so I want to start with a slide, a slide that I put up in one of my first presentations for Open Daylight. And in fact, what you see on the screen here are the three major goals that the Linux Foundation and, and my board handed me in 2013. At the time, there'd never been a major open source project in the networking industry. And so the challenge in front of us was to do multiple things at once that had never been done in this industry. Very few people had participated in an open source project. And of course, the first, the first thing is we were an open source project, so we needed to, to make sure that we delivered code. And there was tremendous um, uncertainty, there was tremendous doubt in the industry whether a whole group of developers who all worked for different competing companies could actually agree enough to deliver code, let alone code that worked. The second thing, of course, is, well, if we built code and nobody, nobody actually deployed it, we've basically wasted our time. And then finally, community. Could we build a community that people wanted uh, to work on? And I think, you know, this was the initial order. I would argue the order is actually uh, not quite right. That in fact, just like Soylent Green, open source isn't code, it's people. And so overall, certainly, Certainly what we're about, if you're not familiar with Open Daylight, is building a platform for software-defined networking. And we, in fact, realized relatively early that we needed to be different from every other SDN controller that had existed in the past. And specifically, rather than try to create something completely new for greenfield networks, what we really needed to impact an industry was to be able to work with people across whatever hardware they had today and to support a wide variety of use cases that they may have today or they may have in the future. And so we were seeking to be, in a sense, a Linux-like platform for SDN for the industry. So not only had this never been done before in this industry in terms of open source, but we were in fact trying to do something with what seemed like an almost undoable scope. And I've got to tell you, when I began to talk to people Regardless of whether you're a senior executive or a developer, most people could come up with 100 reasons why what we were trying to do was impossible and that we shouldn't even try. Fast forward three years now, there was a survey done by SDX Central, and it looked at open daylight versus a whole bunch of other options for SCN solutions. What you find out is end users out there rate open daylight not only the solution that they most consider, but in fact, by far the most deployed solutions. And so one of the questions is how? How did we get to that? I keep getting asked this question, wow, Open Daylight has been such a great success. How did we go from nobody believing in it to just three, four years later, just tremendous impact on the world? And I would say I go back to its people. We made a concerted effort to invest in the community one, to find ways of bringing people together. I'm going to talk a lot more uh, in my talk later this afternoon about how we went and, and did this. But we made an explicit goal for myself and everyone in the organization to find ways to create real bonds of trust between the individuals. When you have that, you can have tremendous tough debates. And at the end of it, you can get some version of consensus and you get great code, you get great results. We wanted to build a community that wasn't just developers and vendors, but also end users. And the impact of that, as you see, is not just great code, but a community that is self-sustaining and keeps getting bigger. 
This is not just about open daylight. What you've seen is that as an industry, we've put more and more people supporting open source code. Here you see the total number of contributors as of, uh, as of this past summer and the total number of commits. It's amazing, it's not just open daylight, but it's great to see that we have been leading the way. And with every release, more and more folks, it's amazing to think that we're just shy of 1,000 people having com uh, committed code to open daylight. The impact of that is our ability to innovate, our ability to try out different things is far superior than what we could do if we were just 30 people in a room somewhere. The other impact is our ability to go from developers at vendors to end users. It's amazing to see AT&T stand up here yesterday and talk about their e-comp platform because at the heart of their e-comp platform is the open daylight controller. They came in and engaged with our first release. And in fact, Margaret Kiyosi, I don't know if she's in there, said, you know, frankly, your code is kind of dog shit, but it's the best dog shit out there right now. And while I didn't love that characterization, I said back to her, I said, you know, and I'm committed to making sure that it's a little bit better with every, with every release. And now it's in production as part of AT&T's main infrastructure delivery platform. Open Daylight today allows the Large Hadron Collider to instead of having to fly all of their researchers in to be able to distribute all of their data to over 200 universities in the world, two terabytes of data are going over managed by open daylight. And we're seeing a massive scale. Companies like Tencent, if you don't know WeChat, you should. WeChat serves 700 million people, most of them in China. And they've got four or five different use cases all running on open daylight. But again, it starts with people. What I hear over and over again is, everyone through the life of ODL has been able to figure out all the ways that we could fail. But at the end of the day, they came and tried to make it better because they respected our vision, but most importantly, they liked our people. And the most satisfying thing for me personally is not all of the incredible impact that this project has had on the world, it's in fact the impact that it's had on people. When I was hearing Dan's talk, for the first time in my life, hearing a talk like that, I'm not just wanting to shout at the TV and say, yes, yeah, someone should do something about it. I realize that however small, what we are doing in this room by creating communities that people love to be in. When I hear people saying, you know, I was in your community, then I went somewhere else. There's something special about your community. That is truly rewarding and makes the 650,000 miles I did over the last three years really worthwhile. And in general, what you see is that then this becomes, this becomes well sought, well viewed. You go from something that nobody thinks is possible to something that people think is almost inevitable. And I think that's great. But I want to leave you with one thought. Where are we today at Open Daylight? In one sense, we're a tremendous success on all three of those things. We've achieved them, I think, in spades. But there's actually a fourth one that wasn't on that list, that should have been on that list, which is money. And I'm sorry to say this. But here's the reality of our world, and this is for Open Daylight, and this is for everybody else in this room, I think, which is we're no longer in a world that most of these projects can be primarily developed by people in their free time. The truth is, someone has to pay all these engineers' salary. And at the end of the day, that comes down to users. For us to be able to invest in hundreds of engineers to build great code to solve real problems, end users are going to have to pay for it. And it can come in one of two ways. Either they pay vendors for support or other products that are adjacent, or they can pay directly and hire the develop developers and put them in. But in too many of our projects, we have a situation where every end user is sitting there doing a cost benefit of adding a few more. The better our open source is, the more we end up competing against the people who need to make money to be able to fund the development. And I think this is our biggest challenge in open daylight over the next few years, especially as many members of the industry are having huge financial challenges. And I believe this is our biggest challenge in open source. How are we going to make these ecosystems truly sustainable? Because what we've got is incredibly special with these communities. We just got, got to make sure that we've architected it right so that it's sustainable over the next 10, 20 years. Thank you. Hello, I'm Glenn Sullivan. Uh, in addition to being a customer advocate at SnapRoute, I also serve as the chair of the governing board for the OpenSwitch project. 
So what is OpenSwitch? OpenSwitch is a fully developed NOS. It works on bare metal switches, white box, whatever you want to call them, disaggregated hardware. It works on any ODM platform. It's fully extensible. And it's based on a contribution by both SnapRoute from the Layer 2 and Layer 3 routing and switching functions and Dell EMC for the base OS, which is based on OS X. The, the greatest thing about the OpenSwitch project is the community. I, I could sit here and rattle off all the names, but what, what, what you'll find out if you start looking a little deeper is that it's Broadcom and it's Mellanox and it's Cavium and it's SnapRoute and it's HP and it's Dell. It's all these classic companies that are considered competitors with each other. And we really have tried as a project to adopt you know, the, the Linux Foundation ethos of Everybody who, who's working together is working in a vendor agnostic, in a, in a non, you know, in an inclusive manner, right? Because these, these people are, are on companies that write competing projects and are going for the same deals and, and, are, and are losing, you know, bids to each other, right? So for them to actually sit in the same room and say, this is how the data path should work. This is how the control plane path should work. This is, this is revolutionary from a, from a networking industry perspective. So, a quick update on OpenSwitch. You might have seen something in the news lately about you know, HP starting the project and then handing it off to uh, Dell EMC and SnapRoute. We're, we're actually rebranding OpenSwitch from OPS to OPX uh, to kind of do the delineation between the two versions because the entire architecture has been completely uh, rewritten and all of the core code is completely changed out in the new versions to take it to the next level for what's really needed in uh, data centers and enterprises everywhere. Oh, and, and the other thing I wanted to point out is we're gonna have a full demo and deep dive of the architecture at the OCP Summit uh, coming up in March. So look for us at Open Compute. Uh, we have several engineering talks. We're gonna do full demos on different, uh, different platforms and really show what you can do with this new version of OPX. Finally, uh, if you would like to get involved, check out our GitHub. Uh, look at the repos that are starting with OPX. That's everything that's new. Uh, sign up for some mailing lists. And we really want to thank the Hyperledger guys, because we talked to them extensively this week. And, and, and they've really, really sold us on Rocket Chat. So we're, we're going to be super excited to get on Rocket Chat. Uh, and this is before we get on Slack. So we're you know, leapfrogging the whole Slack problem going right to Rocket Chat. So we're, we're really, really excited about that. Hi there, I'm uh, Dan Kahn. I'm the executive director of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And I just wanted to take a couple minutes. Uh, if there's some skiers who are looking to sneak out and enjoy the fresh powder, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I am going to give a talk at 2.30 today. Uh, if you're not on the mountain and you're not sneaking out to your flight, uh, I'm going to go a little bit more into CNCF, but in particular just talk about some of the things that we've learned from all the other Linux Foundation projects that have come before us and some of the other foundations about best practices and how we've tried to put those into place. So um, I did just want to review in case you haven't uh, heard of us. We're part of the Linux Foundation. We're actually one of the very newest projects, uh, just a little bit over a year old. And uh, the thing that we're best known for and uh, our biggest and most exciting project is Kubernetes. It is one of the highest velocity projects uh, really in all of technology. It has uh, contributors from all around the world. It has one of the highest commit rates of anything on GitHub. Um, we're also doing a lot of other things that uh, work well with GitHub, work well with other cloud native technologies. Fluent D, Prometheus is a great monitoring app. Uh, these others, we have a, a really great group of companies that are all working together uh, in order to create this new cloud native world. So uh, that, what does that mean? There's been this kind of history of uh, non-virtualized hardware where you had Sun and then you had VMware create this, uh, or popularize the concept of VMs. And then of course everyone knows Amazon Web Services has popularized infrastructure as a service. Heroku came along 
with a platform as a service and trying to make uh, DevOps really accessible to a number of users. Those four first companies in this chart were all um, closed source. And then the next four were all open source offerings. And so uh, OpenStack in 2010 kind of took VMware and AWS, created an open source version of those. This is a very simplified version summary. Cloud Foundry that uh, Abby gave a great talk from this morning has a, a, a really incredible PaaS that's available that's transforming a lot of companies. That's another Linux Foundation project. Uh, Docker in 2013 uh, really popularized this concept of containerization. And then in 2015, uh, Kubernetes and Cloud Native Computing Foundation came along to popularize this concept where you combine com containerizing the application, dividing it up into microservices, excuse me, and then uh, orchestrating those containers together. And uh, it's really those pieces uh, all together that we think is uh, just having an incredible impact. So um, one of the things that's really fun about CNCF is we just have an incredible amount of resources uh, through the Linux Foundation and our other partners. And um, we're working with a number of projects out there and talking to a number of others about um, why they uh, would like to come host with us. You know, GitHub is out there today. So uh, almost every project that we talk to is already on GitHub. We're not, nobody's excited about a mailing list. But by far the most important reason why projects come to CNCF is the very first bullet point there. The neutral home increases uh, contributions. And uh, there's a great example of that. Uh, GRPC, which is a really incredible remote procedure call technology. It originated at Google. It's now being used at AWS, at Microsoft, at actually hundreds of technology companies around the world. It has just a fantastic set of libraries. And um, we are just on the verge of adopting that um, into uh, CNCF, not because we can provide better hosting technology. It's going to stay on GitHub. The URLs for it are all going to be the same but because with a neutral home, all of these other partners are just gonna feel even more comfortable adopting it and basing their infrastructure on top of it. And so these other pieces, we have a really august technical oversight committee, folks like Solomon Hikes from Docker and uh, Brian Grant from Google. And I'm actually uh, really thrilled to report that this is the first time we were able to get all eight of these folks in the same room yesterday here in Tahoe, um, which is the logistics were a little tricky um, but it really just does speak to the value of the Linux Foundation and conferences like this on being able to pull everyone together. We have a $20 million thousand server cluster uh, that was donated to us by Intel that we make available to, uh, both to our own projects and also to uh, other open source uh, efforts out there if you have uh, things you'd like to try. And then user board, our press and analyst teams, some cash for documentation, two amazing events, uh, the big one coming up in Berlin at the end of March, and then Austin at the beginning of December, roadshows, a demo, that kind of thing. This is kind of a crazy eye chart. I will mention at the back bottom left um, that you can see this and download it from GitHub. It's uh, available open source as well, github.com slash cncf slash landscape. But it does show in the five red circles the, uh, the five projects that we have, uh, are currently hosting, and the green circles are the ones that we're talking to or considering, um, and gives you a little bit of a view of uh, how we think of this space, why we're excited about it. And I will just say that, uh, as I mentioned, the Technical Oversight Committee, it does separate out the technical decisions from the governing board, uh, the vendors that fund, uh, fund what we're doing, and then the end user board providing feedback. Um, so I'm not gonna go into the value propositions, uh, but uh, please come by this afternoon, 2.30, if you'd like to um, hear a little bit more about what we're doing, or send me an email, uh, dan at linuxfoundation.org. Thank you very much. Hi, Nico. Hi. So uh, I'm Nico Van Sommeren. I'm the... Uh, executive director of the Core Infrastructure Initiative, and I'm the last thing between you and your coffee. So I'm going to try and keep this short and sweet. Um, so <clears throat> the Core Infrastructure Initiative, as you may or may not know, we're striving to improve the security outcomes in open source projects, in particular those open source projects upon which we build the internet and all of the businesses that run on the internet. And 
we are unusual compared to many LF projects because we don't write code ourselves. We're one of those horizontal slices on Jim's charts as opposed to one of those vertical ones. Uh, and we're finding ways to try to impact as many open source projects as possible. So my eye chart is uh, uh, a little bit of information about the projects that we were supporting in 2016. Uh, this shows uh, a, a lot of data where uh, the circle size depends on the amount of resource we're throwing at the various projects. The uh, color represents what sort of project it is. But what's interesting is we're trying to uh, have a, a, an impact across a lot of projects. We're trying to get increasingly strategic in the way that we do this. When the CII started three years ago, we were born out of the wake of the Heartbleed bug, and a lot of what we were doing was really quite tactical in its approach, in terms of putting resources on projects which were bleeding, and you know, it was a real pass me the tourniquet, we've got to stem this problem. Now we're trying to work more on projects that are going to have broader impact across a lot of other coding projects. So things like the fuzzing project are finding bugs in uh, uh, large numbers of open source projects. We're funding uh, some toolkits, so we're still providing resources into toolkits like OpenSSL and GNU PG and Bouncy Castle, where we're, we're trying to provide crypto resources or security frameworks into uh, other open source projects. Uh, but my x-axis is, is the timeline of the spend, and the y-axis is the tactical versus strategic. And we're trying to move things up and to the left. Uh, I guess I should have made things go up and to the right, because it would have been a better VC pitch slide. But uh, maybe I need to flip one of my axes. Uh, uh, we're trying to keep up in that, you know, things that are getting in there and doing useful stuff that has strategic utility as opposed to uh, particularly you know, pouring more and more resources on uh, you know, uh, one of my bad scores down here, NTPD, managed to uh, go from version 4.2.8 patch 8 to version 4.2.8 patch 10 and set, uh, fix. 13 critical CVEs in the process. I don't call that the sort of development velocity I'm trying to promote. So um, uh, I think one of the most important things that we've been doing at the CII is trying to bring the FOSS security community together. We've been hosting meetings. Um, We've had some general ones where we're just trying to get everybody who's interested in driving security improvement in open source. We've also hosted meetings for uh, things like the fuzzing project, the reproducible builds project, the open SSL project, to try to get those communities to have uh, more interaction. And they've been very positive uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the development velocity that's created, and also the sort of strategic thinking and the, the forward planning by bringing those communities together. So we've had hundreds of people turn up. We've been both hosting the meetings and funding people to get to those meetings because they're doing it on their spare time and they don't have uh, time to spend on it. Um, the, we've also been doing some work this year to try to make it easier to get members into the CII. Uh, we had an unscalable structure uh, last year. We've actually adopted a new charter, so we have tiers of membership. If you want your organization to join the CII, please come and find me. I'm around uh, through today. I'm trying to broaden the member base. Uh, my original members, I have 19 original members, 18 of whom are pure tech companies, and one is, is an information company, so they're an information technology company. Uh, I've got a, a pipeline of members joining who are in retail and aerospace and banking because everybody builds their business on this sort of core infrastructure, and so everybody has an interest in this core infrastructure being secure. So. Uh, 
uh, you know, hopefully more than half of the companies that we'll get to join this year will not be tech companies because we really want to get the whole community involved. Um, and I'm 20 seconds late for your coffee break, so I'm going to leave it at that. But please come and find me if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you.